I'm Jason Klom, and this is the Comedy on Vinyl podcast. The year is 2008. The album is Fred Dagon. And it, ugh, I let me learn to use the words. Um, <laughs> anthology. The artist, John Clark, and my guest is Reese Darby. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Now, you uh, obviously didn't go out of your way to shock me, but I, <laughs> they, I like being surprised. This is going to be my first... My first comedy album from this region of the of the world. So, I'm assuming you grew up with this. This goes back to your earliest memories. This sounds like that kind. Of, it's old enough. Yeah, definitely. Because this is an anthology of albums from the 70s. Yeah. So, Fred Dagg, which is the character he played, mm -hmm. John Clark is the uh, comedian or satirist, um, actor, writer, many things, I guess. But back then, uh, we're looking around 1970. 374 mm -hmm. um this character he created which was the quintessential new zealand farmer mm -hmm. uh fred dag dag of course uh, i don't know whether you know what that means but mm -hmm. it's it's with a sheep a dag is the dried bit of poo that's hanging off their bum they're called <laughs> dags so we we have this saying in new zealand called rattle your dags which means hurry up <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so so that's and fred is the classic you know it's the names the fred dag is his character um and yeah i mean this is obviously i was born in 74 so i mm. mean I, I you know found out about him many years later but he's been an iconic character in new zealand for for that long yeah yeah and so what's your first exposure to him well i know he was a bit on tv but i didn't get to do full research yeah. so for me it would have been um uh, I, I think probably seeing him first, mm -hmm. seeing uh, the piece he did with Country Calendar. Now, mm -hmm. Country Calendar is a uh, very rural New Zealand show. It's I think it's our longest running show. I think mm -hmm. it's still running. Oh, okay. um, so it's basically uh, a documentary series about uh, rural life in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And each week they would... Um, the the presenter would be in some part of New Zealand and just talking casually to a farmer about oh. what's going on in his life. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so what he did, what what uh, John Clark did with his Fred Dagg character was he did a parody. So it was like a twenty five minute. Um, so one version of um, one episode of Country Calendar was about him, mm -hmm. and, and and of course he took it was completely dried very serious but the stuff he was saying was ridiculous mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, including all his i think seven sons called trevor <laughs> and uh various yeah and, and and really so that was sort of seeing that and for me it was so ahead of its time because we're like i said we're talking about you know mid 70s and he's creating this kind of uh humor that we would later see in things like the office mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so um yeah i think it was very ahead of its time and i think what I love about him, first of all, is why I chose him for this, is because it is quintessential New Zealand. He's only really known in New Zealand and Australia. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, I could have chosen so many vinyl comedy records for this thing, um, particularly the Monty Python stuff, which sure. I grew up with. But I thought, you know, I'll choose this guy because uh, he he means a lot. And he, he shaped particularly myself and, and Jermaine, who you know I worked with in the Concords, uh, was very much into his style as well, and I think it there's something about that rural um, intellectual mm -hmm. that uh, yeah that um, I don't know kind of speaks for New Zealanders yeah because we are we are you know trapped in a paradise <laughs> of, of millions of miles from anyone uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, and but we still like to think and we still like to have our opinion sure uh, but we but no one's listening. <laughs> so you know i think that's where it all comes from well yeah i mean uh, that i guess th this is a, one of those things where i'm gonna go ahead and say my ignorance is gonna shine through because you, you speak to some people for instance okay uh and i'm gonna completely forget his name 
uh, biggest French comedian, stand-up comedian, whose name is, uh, oh my God, either way. It's, Marcel it's, Marceau. Yeah, yeah, there we go, Marcel Marceau, <laughs> brilliant stand-up. Um, but friends didn't have stand-up until this guy 20 years ago. Right. And so my expectations, I don't know what to expect of New Zealand. I know mm. that New Zealand's going to have access to it. All kinds of, because, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, but, you know, uh, what, within the last 15 years, it's people just have known it as Peter Jackson's private island. That's mm. basically, so, you know, you don't get any exposure to my, the only comedy I knew from New Zealand is yourself mm. and the Flight of the Concords guys, you know? Yeah. And we, we came from, uh, from John Clark's sort of, uh, um, beginnings. And mm -hmm. then he, when he did this kind of stuff. Uh, it was it's satire. It's very dry. He he his style was there was no set up punchlines. Actually, from hearing the from yeah. hearing what you've heard from the from the album, it's just the way he speaks, and it's very it, it could it's, it's almost as if, if if you were listening from another room, you were listening. You you could hear through, and you and you, and you would think that you were listening to. Um, you know, some sort of documentarian or yeah, or, a, yeah. or, a, or, a, or a political speaker. Absolutely, uh, it's not really go into that actual room and, and listen more carefully. That he's <laughs> he's for, for, for one of a better word, just talking bollocks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and so and I think it's that style where uh, it's and a lot of it is um, stream of consciousness and, uh, yeah. and and a lot of it is Im improvised and and when you think about that, you think, wow, that that he's got a very fast mind and yeah. he's just he's yeah. just spinning spinning um spinning words at you yeah and at the same time you're looking at this guy dressed in a black singlet uh he's got wearing you know uh gum boots which are, uh i guess you call them rain boots over here but they're they're what we wear on farms and uh and it's kind of and i, I it's important because it for me it, it means that um yeah w wherever you are in the world you you too uh are just as important as as someone who's you know uh running a business in new york or whatever i mean yeah. you you uh you may be spending a lot of the day picking up sheep poo and mm -hmm. opening and opening gates mm -hmm. but uh you you have a voice and you and you may and this is a parody of it but with with fred dag but you you may be able to um uh yeah, um, solve problems. Yeah. World problems, big problems. And for lack of a better word, there's so much heart in um, in that because there's, it's not a, a thing you find over here as much. I think if you were to take your typical comedian maybe and yeah. they were to take a rural character from anywhere in this country, mm. you know, I'm from a pretty rural part of upstate New York, immediately becomes a caricature and you're making fun of the way they speak yeah and their their supposed intellect where at the very least you you like you described you've got this place that is a everybody's kind of coalescing so you're yeah. going to have these fascinating combinations that's much more human in terms of the experience it's reflecting and, yeah and we're all linked very much very closely in new zealand there's there's a two degrees of separation as they say mm -hmm. so you know if you're not a farmer yourself, your friend definitely is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or he knows one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so therefore, there's there's less of that uh, far uh, distance hick kind of thing that you have here in the states, mm -hmm. where you know, oh, he's so far away that, that the redneck or whatever, and because mm -hmm. he's doing whatever is way out there, and uh, so that yeah, less of less of that vast space. Mm -hmm. um, of course, in Australia there would be because it's, it's very vast. But New Zealand, it's just two little tiny islands. Yeah, and uh, you know, you, you're never more than an hour from the from the coast. Mm -hmm. So when you for uh, man, and uh, it also reminds me, of course, of short poppies, which was oh, delightful, yeah. which was so much fun to watch. Thank you. Uh, and again, the same kind of heart. I don't know how, okay, so, but it, it is a complicated thing to mix, again, I keep saying heart, it's the only word I can think of right now, but uh -huh. sincerity with genuine satire. Like, you're clearly satirizing, he's clearly satirizing New Zealand, while at the same time, there's a lot of love. Yeah. So, I, when I did, well, that Short Poppies was was uh, definitely off the back of him doing his Fred Dad character on, on this country calendar documentary, and so I thought, what if I could do the same thing um but do you know various characters and have a have a reporter because if you if we look at the footage of of the original fred dag being interviewed on country calendar there was a reporter there there was mm -hmm. a guy standing there and, and a real reporter um and, and and following him around as he as he showed him around the farm and and uh 
and his crazy inventions that he was making and, and you know, out of trash and things. Um, and I thought, well, well I, I, I just adored it. And, mm. and I thought if I could do a collection of characters and their lives could intertwine and they lived in a small town uh, and a reporter just so happened to go out there in the same way and, and find random people in a small town and make it as real as possible, um, then that would be a real treat. And, and also f- fun to pull off and difficult to pull off because um, just just the whole keeping of the straight face. Yeah. You know, yeah. Because a lot of it and with Short Poppies too was improvised and David Farrier is sitting there and just – to his credit, is 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 not laughing. Mm-hmm. Um, on occasion, he would, of course, but uh, and I wanted to expand the world slightly rather than just have a have a series of long form interviews. I wanted to have a few um, little little narratives and plots that mm-hmm. that are happening and amongst it to to give it that um, series appeal. But uh, yeah, that was uh, you can see the definite inspiration I I had from, from yeah. him. Do you, now was this something that you shared with your family? I'm assuming since you saw it on TV or no? Uh, with Fred Dagg? Uh-huh. Yes. Well, yeah, everyone um, that I knew knew of him mm-hmm. uh, and his comedy and then uh, his stuff on vinyl as well. And he was quite famous for his songs. Mm-hmm. So um, in particular, uh, We Don't Know How Lucky We Are, mm-hmm. which is kind of a New Zealand anthem really because, and it still stands today on the the, the idea that the rest of the world is going through a lot of uh, stuff and we're, and we're on this little island and um, don't know how lucky we've got it mm-hmm. to be born in this place. Um, so, yeah, that one. And, and then there's the Gumboot song. There's a few other sort of uh, bits and pieces. Now, when he left, he left New Zealand, um, I think, I want to say that around the 80s, mm-hmm. went to Australia and then and never really returned. And then at that time, and so let's look at the 80s. I mean, I was sort of, um, that was my era. Um, mm-hmm. So I was, a, I was a kid growing up at that point. And the other comedians we had, I guess, at that point, we certainly had uh, his stuff still because it was, it, was, it was recorded and we would see it and hear it quite often. But then there was Billy T. James, which is the other New Zealand um, comedian mm-hmm. who was uh, also a huge icon back home. Um, and he was a uh, singer-songwriter, sketch, the whole works, mm-hmm. um, Maori as well, so okay. um, became very iconic. And he, uh, he was on television, he had his own, his own TV show, um, which also, um, to, to use the, the term, take, take the piss, t- <laughs> take the mickey, take the piss mm-hmm. out of um, who we are. Yeah. Uh, and it became... A thing because uh, with John Clark and then with Billy T. James um, and these are sort of both sides of the coin. You've got your white farmer, you've got your your Maori uh, worker, mm-hmm. uh, entertainer. Um, it was okay. It became our New Zealand thing to take the Mickey out of who we are because mm-hmm. we realised we do know how lucky we are. We're in this amazing country um, that that ha- is plentiful of of uh, food and and uh you know we we have a uh, wonderful agriculture and and uh products and and, and we you know we, we're surviving very well and so um our humor then became um to take the mickey out of who we are as people mm-hmm. because we're so isolated yeah uh so yeah i don't know where i was going with that but <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think I think that's that's the basis of where you see a flight of the Concord. Sure, you know when when people watch that show, mm. they went, "Why are you guys so? I mean, you're taking the <laughs> ma- major Mick out of out of who you are mm-hmm. as people because you know Murray Hewitt was just an absolute idiot, mm. you know, and he's the cultural attaché, <laughs> um, and the posters on his wall and his 1970s computer and 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 the. Uh, you know, and then you've got these two cool-looking idiots who mm-hmm. are the, you know, the Concords who are, <laughs> uh, are, are, are supposed to be a, a popular band um, who who's you know being being led by someone who knows nothing about band management, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> and yet 
uh, this is our humour, yeah. and we really, really enjoyed it. And and we and the New Zealand and we actually were worried a little bit there because even that 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 back home they would go, how dare you mm-hmm. portray us in this way, <laughs> you know, of, course, of yeah. such being such fools. But they didn't. They loved it, and they yeah. realised, you know. The whole thing is a big joke, and we're the ones laughing at the end of the day because we managed to get a show on HBO yeah. and, and the wonderful America, and it's a huge, huge deal. So, um, yeah, so that, so there, you can see how the it all it all comes back um, to the seventies and with 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 Fred. It's uh, see, and that's the exciting thing to me is. And we'll get, I want to get to the fake sport on here in a second because it kind of ties in with it. Um, New Zealand is so, such a young country. Um, yeah. The, the, but, but comedy, so therefore, you, it's probably easier, I would imagine, to track the history of comedy in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Very so, easy. So that's what's, <laughs> that's what's so friggin' great about it to me as like a, you know, like a kind of an archivist. And I'd never call myself an archaeologist, but I am interested in the history of comedy. Right. Um, before this character, before before, uh, do you? What's your experience or knowledge of New Zealand comedy before this? Before Fred Day? Yeah. Oh, nothing. See, this is yeah. this is what's blowing my mind a little bit because mm. I would imagine if anybody would know, it would be yourself. No, he, yeah, no. I, I mean, um, yeah. I don't know if it goes back any. Further. <laughs> yeah. Well, I just want to know how how a man like that. Definitely got to be something happening in the in the sixties. Sure. I, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I know that Billy T. James goes back quite far okay. as well. And, and then there's there's certainly been others since then and and, mm-hmm. and during then. You know, I could mention many, uh, the Top Twins, um, McPhail and Gadsby. They were very uh, political satire. So mm-hmm. they all their um, material was was built around um, the the politics of our country. Mm-hmm. Um, but going back even further, I mean, I. I really, I really think it was, it was definitely because we're very um, strongly British, mm-hmm. definitely back in the '60s, and so all of our comedy would have come across from the BBC. It would have mm-hmm. been radio, BBC radio stuff, and I know that that's what inspired um, John Clark initially as well, with the way that he would be very, um, very wordy mm-hmm. with his, with his comedy, because um, it would have definitely been radio based at the start. So yeah, um, other than that. Um, it would have there would have definitely been um, just all round entertainers like like touring some of the um, working men's clubs mm-hmm. with with guitar and and song. And yeah. I know that's what Billy T. James did too at okay. the start. Yeah, um, and then probably said a few old man's jokes in between. Mm-hmm. You know that mm-hmm. kind of thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the comedy explosion really happened. Uh, I don't want to say it was it was it was me and and the gang, but mm-hmm. I think it definitely ha- happened later mm-hmm. in terms of stand up and stuff like that happening. Um, Mike King, uh, I'm just rattling off names now that won't mean <laughs> anything to people, but when you look at it, mm-hmm. um, well, at least listeners on, on this side of the world, but um, uh, yeah, I would say um, the first comedy club which opened up in um, Auckland. Uh, called the Classic, which used to be a porn theatre, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> opened. I think I'm not sure what the date was now, but um, around about 1995. Okay. Yeah. All right. I mean, yeah, that's good. You know. Yeah, that was gonna be my next question. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, I was actually shocked because I had a, um, a gentleman named Rich Schneider Schneider on here. Amazing guy, wonderful. Has a great history with comedy. He's been in it for 40 years, and he was there for basically the first comedy club like that that guys were going to in the 70s and that hurt my brain because before that guys were just going to dinner club diners yeah. and stuff you know like or or uh, nightclubs or whatever but strictly comedy clubs started in the 70s that hurt my brain i guess i'm actually surprised then that that, that yeah I, i'm very surprised that the 90s is the earliest that you're going to see that in new zealand mm. god that's that's it's mind-blowing a little bit to me yeah and i think it's it harks back to for a long time, we we were never we never really had the confidence with 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 um, comedy because mm-hmm. it was what we received was mainly British, and then there was also um, American stuff coming through, and definitely mm-hmm. with with television. Sure. So we um, we absorbed, uh, I would say, the best of the British and the best of American sitcoms. Yeah. And we struggled to, apart from some of those names I've mentioned, uh, come up with what our own humour would be. Yeah. And also we have a tall. Pro- Tall poppy syndrome in New Zealand, which is where 
that TV show Short Poppies comes from because the tall poppy syndrome. Have you heard of that? That's where I've heard you talk about it, and I've completely you, forgotten. Okay, so about, tall poppy syndrome <laughs> is if you. When you stick your head out, um, you get it cut off. Okay. Like okay. okay. <laughs> All right. So therefore, um, we have a small population, and I think if anyone starts to sort of wave their head about and, mm-hmm. and look at me and be confident, mm-hmm. then the rest of the people will go, "Hey, calm down, mate. Yeah. Calm yeah. down. Who do you think you are?" Yep. Uh, and they and they and they slice you off because um, that it's that kind of rural mentality of you know. Stop showing off, mate. Get 100%. back into the into the shed and milk the cows, yeah. like the rest of us. And mm-hmm. we'll all play rugby, mm-hmm. and then you know. And so uh, that was felt, and I think that's gone now. Mm-hmm. But well, I feel like it's not completely gone, but it's definitely diminished. Um, and I I really tried to make that diminish, yeah, because uh, I felt it when I when I would come back, um, and and that's not so long ago, two thousand nine, you know, mm-hmm. um, but. Uh, once again, I've gone off track. Of- <laughs> <laughs> that is a sign of me as an interviewer, not you as an interviewee. Do not worry. Yeah. No, but that, that I, I completely understand that feeling too, being from a rural area. But again, I also yeah. had a lot of fucking options. I got to just go to Chicago. You know, right. I got to just go to Chicago and see if there were options. When culturally, just entirely culturally it's like no don't don't try <laughs> yeah don't get up don't don't <laughs> don't say you know uh, th- and there wasn't even really too many places to to get up and tell jokes yeah and so once the club started opening up um and you know the floodgates were open people mm-hmm. could try stuff out and then um slowly over time we got uh we got a confidence mm-hmm. and 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 i think it was um, once, once the Concord's TV show hit America, and then we almost immediately realised that's what that's what our comedy is. We love taking the Mickey of our, out of ourselves yeah. because we and we do it with a straight face, and we make it we do it so well yeah. that the audience are baffled as to whether this is really what we're like, <laughs> or are they that is he that funny? And, and I, for years, even when I with the Murray Hewitt thing, I would go anywhere, and people would be absolutely shocked that I'm not dressed like him <laughs> or that, I, you know, or like I've got some hip clothing on or whatever. Uh-huh. And then they go, well, you, you, you got a stylist or, you know, you know, no, no, this is what I'm like. And so, oh, they really believed that, you know, I was that guy Holy and, shit. and they love that guy, and which, mm-hmm. is, which is great. And I love that guy too, but I'm not, I'm not going to rock a goatee, you know, <laughs> for 12 months of the year. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, if you, um, but it, it, I guess my question is in, in this, uh, in such a small community in general, like just as, as, as a culture, how do you know that it's an option to do comedy then? If, if that's, if that's the prevailing theme. Yeah. And I, I think it, well, I, I, I love to say that it comes naturally to those that should be doing it. Mm-hmm. And I grew up, my mum uh, she had a great sense of humor. Uh, my dad as well. They weren't together with me as, as I grew up, I only had uh, mum, but both parents w- were pretty funny, mm-hmm. and mum in particular, who who brought me up uh, every day, she saw the lighter side of things mm-hmm. and um, didn't take anything very seriously. And uh, and I think that's a little bit of a detriment to me because I I never take anything seriously. So I, you know, if I didn't marry the right person, I'd be living under a bridge right now, <laughs> owing so much money to so many people. But uh, thank God I I did well there and and married the right person, and um, I'm in control. Well, she's in control, but <laughs> I. <laughs> but anyway, um, and so I think uh, I, I I didn't even start off, um, you know, thinking I was gonna I was gonna be a comedian. Mm-hmm. I joined the army straight after school. I thought I was going to be a soldier. For for some reason, I thought I should be dropped in behind enemy lines and rescue POWs or something. I mean, I think I watched too many war films. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, and I kind of, I was late to mature and I didn't really know what I was supposed to be. I, 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 I ended up leaving the army and going to university then to try and find what it was I was going to be. And I thought perhaps a journalist because I, I, I liked... Uh, English Mm -hmm. as a subject and and I was fairly good at writing Um, but thank God it was university that uh, threw in my face the idea that it should be comedy that I should be doing Mm -hmm. because there was a a comedy club Um, you know how universities have clubs and societies and and a chap named 
Guy Roberts signed me up. Uh, he saw, I think it was the way I was walking. He said, come over here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you want to join the comedy club? And I did. And, and it was a, you know, a, a bunch of like-minded um, people that met once a week and wrote sketches and stuff. That's and all great. of a sudden I found my thing. And oh. I realized this is what I should be doing. I've been laughed at my whole life. Uh-huh. <laughs> and, and I like... I'm the class clown. I like making people laugh, but I never thought of it as a vocation, mm-hmm. uh, especially not in New Zealand because I just we didn't have a like I said we didn't have the the infrastructure, we didn't have the comedy clubs or uh, you know there was only these only a few people that were that were known for doing it and and uh, even though I, I loved comedy and I was obsessed all the way through that point with Monty Python and 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 BBC comedy um for me it was probably in my mind the other you know and I would never I wouldn't be able to to be that um so it was when I started doing it at university and actually being involved in some of the and 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 the sketches and we and we put on a uh, an annual show the capping review and I got huge applauds by going out and doing something on stage and uh I say huge you know it was probably wasn't huge <laughs> but I'm lo- looking back with <laughs> with a, 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 a yeah um I enjoyed it yeah. and realized, oh, okay, so I, 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 can, I am good at this. Um, but still then the next problem was, you know, how am I going to? So I just decided it would be a hobby. And then All I right. carried on and, and did other jobs. And then slowly the hobby became, took over. And at that very same time, we started to getting television. Uh, we got a stand-up show on TV okay. where they would uh, recruit young comics. And, and so you know, there was... Um, there was certain things happening, and then I'm just telling you my life story now. And then it was, it, it, then it was, it happens, it happens. <laughs> go to Edinburgh and uh, do the do the fringe in Edinburgh, and then then the rest is history. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Is there uh, for you? I mean, because I I guess this is the part I did not get to his to to John Clark's uh, biography was what you told me is him just basically going to Australia, and that's mm. that's kind of the end of it. I mean. Did his comedy then become, I assume, no longer about being a New Zealander? I assume. No, he, no, he kept it going. Okay. He kept the okay. New so Zealand the same thing going. Thing. And and also... With the same, like, feel? Was it... Is, yeah, as, yeah. Okay. And, then right. he, and then he worked with um, other people and, and then sort of integrated into the Australian society. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Uh, kept the same style going okay. and, and worked on various projects in Australia and um, decided to, to remain there. And, you know, there's all sorts of rumors about him being scared of flying and never okay. wanting to return because he didn't want to get in a plane. But okay. I don't know whether that's true or not. <laughs> uh-huh. I just think he found a good thing in Australia. And and I wonder, I mean, there's a, a some of it could have been the, the tall poppy situation or something. I, I know his for his what he was doing in New Zealand it was quite ahead of its time, and I yeah. don't know whether uh, I, I'm assuming that he was getting a few uh, uh, nose to to progressing and, mm-hmm. and where he should have gone. Like, for example, getting his own show or something. And right. I think, right. Um, the television there probably the heads who are you know. I'm pretty sure that the same people running it now <laughs> are so old fashioned. They just don't get that comedy changes okay, sure. and, and that um, I think he was probably denied a few options and so thought, well, I'm, I'm going to the, I'm going to the big country next door. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think doors opened there yeah. for him and, and, and he remained and, and is still there now, still doing the same great stuff. It's crazy. Yeah. I, I I love that. Do you have so I mean we, uh, like I said you had me listen to an anthology so I got to listen to a ton more than I usually get to yeah, listen to for right. one episode. Sorry about that. Oh no 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 that was fun. It was so much. I now don't get me wrong. Like every time I think that I can navigate an accent I'm unfamiliar with, there are times when I got completely lost. Right. You know everyone the slang mostly yeah, is yeah, what yeah. throws you. Even if I know what the the word is. I get a little thrown. And That's he sad. makes up a lot of his... Oh, yeah. He's well, got a way with words. That I, that I yeah. loved. That reminded me so much of... And again, this is 15 years before Stephen Fry, but it reminded me a lot of the stuff Stephen Fry used to do. Right, yeah. On a bit of Fry and Laurie. And yes. just that kind of... The garbage mouth. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? yeah, and yeah. I, But with such confidence, like you say, and such dryness. Yeah. It's just so... No time. There's no room to laugh as well. It's just, no, just keeps yeah. going. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then so it's... 
you just enjoy it. It's like a jumping on a ride and just listening to the 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 lyrics. Mm. Yeah, and and the way it's said. Uh, I although there is one one part that genuinely threw me for a loop, and I I did laugh out loud at, which was him talking about, and I'm assuming it was the Dag character because it's not all him, right? It's just, it's him occasionally. He's doing yeah. different characters, yeah. but I assume it was that character talking about philosophy and saying that ennui was French for Henry. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, he just kept saying "pulling a Henry," which is one of the fucking funniest things I've ever heard. And I kind of feel like should enter everybody's lexicon for when people have, have ennui. Pulling a Henry, it's fucking delightful. <laughs> and there's just so much. I mean, I don't know. There, uh, I, I mean, I can tell you at least my favorite part. Actually, oddly, was uh, the whole. There's a whole Parliament bit, which is all about whether or not they should be broadcasting Parliament meetings. Really, oh, wow. yeah, and that's yeah. one of my favorite parts in this. Do you have a favorite? sketch on this or of all time of his um where's the do you have the list uh, yeah let me pull up the track list absolutely it is right here um, i know there's a lot on there there is a lot but there you are <laughs> um okay well there's a few things i really love um the flea race because <laughs> <laughs> because uh i i was inspired by this uh and my comedy i i was in a duo with a, a guy called grant lobin mm -hmm. and uh he does a similar bit where um the fl the flea race pe piece in this is uh commentary given from a uh a commentator at the races so it's that style of racing this time when he's going around the outside and you know and 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 to keep that up for one thing mm -hmm. is, is is quite the trick um but then to uh obviously instead of horses it's fleas mm -hmm. and then when the other fleas come around the outside to beat the the flea that he wants to win which is daggy boy uh he just stomps on them <laughs> uh so yeah i love that one because of the uh the way he he keeps up the commentary mm -hmm. um I also love uh uh if you have a look at this earlier stuff here um the 21st speech because it's a classic um New Zealand kind of guy we have this sort of a man's man kind of male rural male really having a lot to say about someone but literally saying nothing about them <laughs> so and it's that you, know, you have to give a speech you've got nothing about the guy and you just ramble and that was sort of the that's i think that's like one of the first tracks on yes, here. It is, and yep. so you kind of figure that uh you see what he's good at which is just rambling and, and hearing his own voice um and the other one i really like uh let me see oh well these um so many here if you, if you look at some of the later ones where he's um working with uh his partner mm -hmm. and they are yeah there are a lot of great interviews that are of if i'm not mistaken government government personalities or at yeah least officials being, of some kind he's being interviewed as a politician yes right. um talking about one of them is, is the environment one on here is that on here mm -hmm. where he's talking about oh yeah protecting the environment um and also the one that follows it which which is the front fell off <laughs> about an oil tanker uh out at sea and uh he's I mean, he would have made an amazing politician yeah because he's just got the gift of of talking to you uh, making you believe that you know it's all. Uh, I think I've accidentally played it there. It's <laughs> You're right. At least my headphones are on. <laughs> yeah, that it's. But he's telling you, he's giving you nothing. Yeah, and it's just it's the art of art of conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's pretty um, prevalent in this day and age when you look at what the current political climate of here. Of course. About how you know when when in particular, obviously our president when he's asked questions. I mean, I mean he's, he certainly doesn't have the art of, art of conversation no, to be no, able to right. get around it. But, yeah. you know, you need to be able to um, sound, sound intellectual, uh, tap into the idea of the, um, of the question. Sure, sure. And, and, and just dance around it in a, such a magical way <laughs> whereby, you know, the, the person who has asked the question has, has, ends up walking away satisfied. It's not probably till 20 minutes after he's caught the bus home and he's thinking, hang, hang on, that wasn't <laughs> even an answer, you know? And I think, I think, that's, I think that's a real gift. Yeah. Um, and I, I, 
I created a, a comedy character that that was inspired by Fred Dagg, which is a, a ranger called Bill Napier. Mm -hmm. And I've played him quite often um, where I dress up as a park ranger and I come out on stage and I do a deeper voice than I normally have, which I enjoy because I, I, I get so um, sick of my own voice. Cause <laughs> I, <laughs> so it's nice to, to have a, a, a deeper one, a more manly. Uh, I, I'd like to play a, a manly man. And he is inspired by Fred Dagg because he... He is a rural uh, man, and he and he uh, he talks he talks the talk as well. So uh -huh. it's it's a similar. It certainly, by no means has the sort of uh, intellectual and and uh, um, uh, lyrical kind of um, poetic uh, uh, follow throughs that mm -hmm. he has, but but he. He does has the does have the same as you say before heart, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it's that kind of you have empathy for these people because you you give them the time of day. Yes, and I think and I think that is so important in comedy, and and I think I've done that with most of my characters is, um, you will you'll listen to them and you won't automatically you know how when you meet someone within thirty seconds you might go oh I don't like this person, <laughs> and I I don't give them I don't want to give anyone ever that that option I think you need to be likable, um, to to be loved and, yep. and to be and to be laughed at and you can, and it's okay to be laughed at as long as people are walking away liking you right you know yeah yeah and yeah, uh, yeah. and I don't think. Some of the uh, some of the people in our c current political political climate have have that. Ah, I'm, I would absolutely. <laughs> yeah. They're laughed at, but they're not. Yeah, they're not kind of. Oh, he's adorable. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't get that anymore. I, yeah, I, 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 they're I all horrible. <laughs> I wonder if that was our ignorance before this, and we yeah, just missed it the I whole know. time. But it's very hard to say. A new wave of pricks. Uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> did, okay, so were the were these albums sitting? Did you have the albums in the house growing up? Um, I think I had one of them. Mm -hmm. My brother had, um, I have an older brother. He's nine years older than me. And he, he had a, quite a lot of, um, LPs and I inherited them. Okay. And so I had, uh, I think it was, uh, Fred Dagg's greatest hits. It mm -hmm. was called. And that was, I think that was in like a 1974 album. Um, and, and so that would have been some of the stuff from this anthology would have sure. been on there. And I think it, def it probably had, um, we don't know how lucky we are. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, it's, it was just injected into the psyche of New Zealanders that he, he, even just that one song, just, just dropping that song and then heading off. And then mm -hmm. we all would have gone, yeah, you're right. And then of course now he's gone. Yeah, <laughs> he, yeah, I'm yeah, moving yeah. to Australia. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, it meant a, it meant a lot. And I think like I've already, we've already talked about, um, his style of of comedy was certainly wasn't the here's a joke coming at you right now there's your punchline uh, -huh. uh it was it was um the stream of consciousness yeah and, and to enjoy um someone's ramblings almost mad ramblings yes absolutely i, I didn't expect i didn't know uh, that I was mostly going to be getting, at least towards the beginning of this anthology, mostly like monologue style stuff. Yeah. And I really like it, actually, because it's it's actually, it's not easy to be compelling that way at all. No. Stand-up's one thing where you either get to tell a story or play a character in a certain way, but he is quite distinctly talking at you. Yes. You know? And at the end, the some of the later tracks, which are uh, with, uh, I think, Brian... Uh, Dow or Dow, whoever his Australian partner is, mm -hmm. you get you get the two. So you get um, which are a series of sort of interviews where you you get more back and forth. So instead of it just being a monologue, you're getting he's getting questioned, yeah, and uh, and then he, he's you know he's thinking on his feet, yeah, trying to uh, as as a, as a whatever politician he's playing, trying to solve the the current situation that's uh, he's got no hope of solving. <laughs> I feel like it's on. I kind of feel like you're lucky that this is the guy that that, that happened when he did because mm. if I think about because I'm doing this thing where I'm listening to because I got so many comedy albums I'm listening to one a day for the whole year right. just to burn wow. through them and some of that involves listening to some local comedians from the 50s and 60s like from all around the country wow. and it's mostly shit yeah and the fact that there's this you know guy doing stand up that stands out but not just that me listening to it now 40 years later that I still genuinely find it funny like that says a whole lot to his skill 
and again, how I guess how lucky New Zealand is that they got this as their guy. Yeah, you know, absolutely. And and we don't know how lucky we are. Right, right. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> we should end it there. Except I got I got to keep you for at least I don't have to keep you, but I I do want to ask what. So let's talk about some of the, your other influences because you yeah. did talk about Python. Mm. What what English stuff were you getting, and well, British stuff in general, but what American stuff were you getting as well? Well. I'm a funny one because I didn't really collect comedy albums. Mm-hmm. I didn't really, um, I mean, I, I I certainly had an infatuation with Monty Python, uh, watching watching their shows mm-hmm. uh, and then buying their, um, I would have been cassette tapes at that point. Like, sure. And most, mostly the Monty Python Sings, which is all of their of course, musical yeah. numbers. I think that was a double cassette uh, with the big tongue on it. Mm-hmm. Loved that. Um and then I think, and then I think I started to try and basically collect everything that they ever did. Um, but I, I wouldn't have been. Yeah, it was the it was the eighties, so I wouldn't have been really a vinyl situation. Would have been sure. probably be a lot of stuff on on cassette tapes. I just I wish those things never ever happened. <laughs> but um, uh, and I have no idea what happened to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but anyway, um, I since um, I have since bought every all this stuff on vinyl. Now I have it all on vinyl. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was so it was them, um, and then I guess from this this side of the pond, I've always been Steve Steve Martin mm-hmm. uh, fan, um, but didn't really uh, didn't didn't purchase anything. You remember I joined the army when I was eighteen or actually seventeen, so I got straight out of school. I was you know I was a soldier, mm-hmm. so there was no time for collecting comedy albums first. <laughs> Of course, <laughs> I was defending my country, but uh, yeah, um, and I think and then I was a big Jim Carrey fan. Mm-hmm. So um, also, yeah, I guess um, one for one on each side of the Atlantic. Really, for me, it was like also Rowan Atkinson. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was a big Blackadder fan, sure. um, and the Young Ones, Rick Mail, um, and then. Uh, I listened to a bit of Bill Cosby back mm-hmm. in the day as well. Um, so I'm just trying to go from back and forth from yeah, the yeah, different yeah. sides. So those <laughs> those were kind of the things I was in. Oh, of course, Eddie Murphy, mm-hmm. uh, Raw and Delirious. Um, just just by just by seeing them, just that was probably the first time I thought I realised that. Hang on, can stand up be cool? <laughs> right, you know, I think right. every, a lot of people probably felt that too. And, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, the red leather. I mean, but then you know, but he is he is who he is, and you know, it doesn't mean that I could be called at that point. But uh, I was definitely um, a big fan of Spike Milligan. I uh-huh. have to bring him into the fray, so you'd know all about him and the Goons. Peter Sellers, of course, who uh, then went on to really be my kind of major inspiration for my acting and and things like that. Um, so yeah. Um, and I guess, yeah, what I'm trying to say is it was certainly character-based um, actor-style comedies, not not so much stand-ups. Mm-hmm. And I think, I, although I do do stand-up, it is very theatrical and character-based and, and physical. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that's probably I'm a, I'm a, a result of watching a lot of um, yeah theatrical-style um, silliness. As, yeah. a, as opposed to a guy behind a mic telling uh you know telling you how it is sure 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 yeah so i'm definitely <laughs> in the in the in the in the other pool and so therefore on my own doing stand up um and i had the duo as well with grant it was always uh yeah silly uh, recreations of scenes mm-hmm. um not nothing uh prop heavy we didn't re- you know we had my had the odd thing but not really uh it wasn't so much reliant on that, but certainly, uh, or, or, or costumes for that for that matter. It was always just um, the where we would shape our bodies in a different way and 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 put on different voices mm-hmm. and uh, and I would do sound effects and things. And then when I went solo, I kept doing that, and so that's yep. still what I do today. So it's kind of ended up being, yeah, it's something that if you haven't seen my, me perform, it's, it is probably. A little different to anything you would have seen, really. Right. Yeah. 
Well, you're. I mean, when you said Steve Martin, that kind of uh, kind of lit a bulb off because, uh, which is not a phrase that anybody's ever said. Lit a bulb <laughs> off. <laughs> Fuck me. Well, I went with it. But yeah, thank you very much for that. But it, it, you, uh, it, that immediately made me think that that's probably what you. I, I could closest equate your yeah. comedy to. Um, even it's. Whoa! What was that? Yeah, noise? I. I <laughs> Sorry, there's just a loud scream of something. This, this I don't neighborhood, know it, since Ikea has moved in, I'm telling you, <laughs> it's going off the charts. There's murders, uh, kit sets. But you've got this thing where you, you're not afraid to make the character of you on stage look stupid. Yeah. And people, by the way, I think a lot of comics say that, you know, you have to be willing to be but the butt of the joke. I don't think most of them are. No. Uh, I don't think it's as common. People will say that as a thing you do. Mm. But I think you genuinely do it. Oh, know? yeah. I, I love... And I think you, you maybe you have to have extreme confidence to be able to then really take the piss out of yourself mm -hmm. um, in various scenes in various ways. And I and I believe it too. And I and I know that in real life, you know, I can be a complete klutz and an idiot. Sure. Um, but but for the most part, I'm not. Mm -hmm. And um, for the most part, I do hold it together. I'm a normal guy. And sometimes I even do some good things, but when I, you know, but I'm quite capable of slapsticky silliness, it, it just in real life. Yeah. And, and finding myself in situations where I'm, you know, either getting chucked out of a bar like I was the other night, <laughs> or, 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 um, you know, just lost and confused in some sort of department store and having to get help. Um, you know, these things happen to me, and of so, um. Uh, you know, I'm not afraid to recreate those scenes on, on stage. And I think it's because, you know, once you get more successful and you realize, look, it's okay. Um, you know, I'm now 42. I've, I've, I've made it um, this far in my life. Um, I'm, an, I'm going to enjoy, um, you know, telling people some of the stuff that's happened to me so that they can have a really great laugh and enjoy their Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, and that's I. Yeah. It, you're, it's a very weird. If again, it, it it's an in between between uh, Steve Martin, and I guess you're you're like a Louis C.K. who likes to he'll apparently tell very real stories on it. Right, but you will tell that with a twist. Yes, and I you do. Know? Yeah, and I and and you know it's not all true. Sure, and you can tell when you know I'm clearly going off into the realms of fantasy, uh -huh, uh -huh. like where there's a mermaid involved or a jetpack <laughs> or, uh, you know, I'm ejecting a, an odd-looking woman out of my car. You know, these things didn't happen. But in my mind, you know, they, they did. Sure. And so you can take it all with a grain of salt. And, you know, I have a new show coming up, which is another collection of stories of things that have happened to me or may or may not have happened to me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and usually some of it has, and, mm -hmm. and then I just extend it. To well, in my old days when I started doing stand up, I, I would tell these stories, and I thought, well, they've got to have an ending. Um, I used to end most of my stories with some sort of explosion. <laughs> so <laughs> one one story was I was about me trying to put the the seatbelt on in a taxi, and you know how these seatbelts that sometimes they just don't quite go. Mm -hmm. they, they get halfway down and they keep locking. You know, it keeps you know, you've got to try and caress it and mm -hmm. try and put it pull it on a certain angle. So, and meanwhile, you know, with half an hour into the taxi drive, and I'm still trying to get this <laughs> thing on. <laughs> And this was the whole story was just this epic journey of me trying to get the seatbelt. <laughs> and in the end, uh, I think um, I wound down the window and, and leapt out or something and the car hurtled into a, a superstore <laughs> and just blew up. And, uh, you know, clearly that didn't happen. But uh -huh. I, in my mind, you know, that's where things were getting. And so uh, I have uh, a big artistic license to yeah. be able to, yeah, um, I think, yeah, just the result of having a big imagination. Yeah. And, um it's it's yeah i've been called a little cartoony sometimes and stuff but yeah that's um i think it's it's just fun you yeah know? well and again it, it takes skill to be able to be that cartoony and also keep it dry and seemingly yeah. real and that you believe it yeah that of course makes you come across as insane and that's great <laughs> that's great yeah I, I love it um okay so if you were going to recommend this anthology or any mm. of his albums to somebody who's never heard it before as i had not until today What's, how do you condense why to listen to his material? Why listen to it? Yeah. Yeah. Because I think it's important to 
first of all, see where the root of comedy came from, from New Zealand, mm -hmm. um, because we have certainly made a little bit of a stamp on the world market now mm -hmm. um, through some of the things I've done with the Concords and with Taika and some of the movies he's making. Mm -hmm. And I think we there's something about New Zealand humour that people are going, oh, yeah, yeah, that's different again, because it's not... It is definitely uh, has elements of British and American, mm -hmm. um, but it has a very a, a, a an innocent and very heartfelt rural um, beat to it. Yeah. And if you want to know where all that came from, then I think this is the guy, and you'll be able to see it by listening to this album. And also <clears throat> that we do love to um, stand up and be confident and and improvise even though we come from a country where certainly uh, definitely back in, in the 70s and, and and through right up until just recently um we, we were stopping ourselves from from doing it yeah and um you know he he moved to australia i, I moved away as well mm. <laughs> moved to mm. america i have since returned many times of course and always will but um we need to get to a point where we're comfortable with our humor in our own country. And I think yeah. we're finally getting there now. We've got some really great young comedians who are doing the same kind of comedy, but we're in a country where we're all kind of um, happy with ourselves now. And that's, yeah. it's, it's the whole young country thing, like you mentioned. Mm, um, sure. we're, as we're getting older, we're, I think we've, I felt like New Zealand is a, a teenager now, a, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, 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 um, it's not a cocky teenager, mm -hmm, and I don't mm -hmm. think, hopefully it never will be. That's Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but a teenager that has certainly has talent and knows it. Yeah. And I think we're there now. And, um, yeah, this guy knew this, knew it in the 70s. Yeah. So I think he's pretty special. It's nice to be able to have pride in, in what you do and what your whole country does. Like, yeah. That's friggin', that's fantastic. Um, I'm only pulling up my phone here because I want to tell you when this episode's coming out, unless it needs to come out sooner, but do you have anything to promote? Um, no, only, only... Um, this is going to come out March 15th, unless you need it earlier. Okay, yeah, no, I'll be in Fiji then, filming Wrecked Season th 2. Oh my God, all right. TBS. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the tour, I'm doing a, uh, New Zealand tour mm -hmm. of stand up um, with my new show. So that is July, August. So wow, this would okay. be lovely to, uh, to mention that. So yeah. we can get some, the, all the comedy fans who I'm sure will come to my show anyway, but, uh, <laughs> if they're having, if they were, oh, I don't know, I think that guy's, you know, he's past it now, <laughs> you know, he's, <laughs> well then listen to this and you'll know where it all comes from and, and how much, uh, John Clark's always meant to me. Um, and, and then when I hit the rural towns, I'm doing 18, uh, I was going to say cities, but, uh, small villages mm -hmm. in New Zealand, mm -hmm. uh, this year's my biggest, biggest tour I've done. I normally do a tour every couple of years. Mm -hmm. So it's been, it's been three years since the last one. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to doing these, going back to my roots and my small town, um, places in New Zealand and, uh, doing, doing exactly this. Yeah. And I should point out, you make a delightful turn on Lemony Snicket's a series of unfortunate events. Oh, thank you. As Don Johnson's boyfriend. I, I know. To point out, it's fucking amazing. <laughs> it's Holy a little bitch. crap. That blew my mind. That was just... It's, so weird, right? It's weird, but friggin' great. Yeah. It was perfect. Um, well, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. This has been a ton of fun. It was a pleasure. Um... I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, you know, we were going to talk about the fake sport on here. I'm just going to say, listen to the album. I did a documentary about a fake sport. That's the next thing I'm going to I'm going to promote. Oh, cool. uh, go to bit.ly forward slash Soaptown DVD. I got a movie called Lords of Soaptown. It's about a sport that started out as fake and became real. And it was a prank. And then it became a real thing. And then it's a crazy movie. Go see that. I'm listening to a comedy album a day. If you go to youtube.com slash comedy on vinyl, I'm reviewing them uh, mostly day by day. I'm a few days behind, but you can forgive me at this point. Uh, uh, well, that is about it. Thank you guys for listening. And as always, have a good thing. Comedy on Vinyl is a production of Stolen Dress Entertainment. It is produced by Mike Warden and is hosted and edited by Jason Klom. Our theme song was composed and performed by Richard Levinson. Please visit StolenDress.com to listen to our other podcasts, read our blogs, read our tweets, watch our videos, and read our books. Please subscribe on iTunes, and if you like us, give us a five-star rating and a nice review. 
You can find us on Facebook.com slash Comedy on Vinyl, Twitter at Comedy on Vinyl, and find everything else at ComedyOnVinyl.com. A major portion of Comedy on Vinyl has been underwritten by Stand Up Records. Please visit StandUpRecords.com for all your comedy needs and tune into the new Stand Up channel available on the Roku, where you can also find select episodes of this podcast. Thank you.